Good morning, Sipa. Thank you very much for agreeing to sit with me for this interview. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Trishila. Such an honour to be here. A privilege indeed. As you may know, this is the first in a series of interviews of maritime personalities conducted by the International Malaysian Society of Maritime Law. And it is hoped that these interviews will benefit the maritime community by allowing movers and shakers in the industry to share their wealth of knowledge and experience. Wonderful. You are an accomplished maritime lawyer, arbitrator, member of several shipping committees, a wife, a mother, and most recently, an author, with the release of your book, The Arrest of the Superyacht Equanimity. My question to you is, how did it all begin? Can you tell us what led you on the path to law and of all areas, maritime law? Trish, um, obviously it all began with my beautiful parents and um, uh, we are from a Slonis family. So very um, traditional, very protected childhood, uh, but they valued very much and taught us integrity, faith in God, kindness, and education was very important. Uh, to the Slonis community, Sri Lankan community. And so I uh, went to school in Convent Bukit Nana, spent 11 good years as a good convent girl. Uh, and I had fantastic role models. And, you know, the, the motto of Bukit Nana is simple in virtue, steadfast in duty. And I think every convent girl carries that and uh, I'm no exception. So after my Form 5 in Bukit Nana, I went to Singapore. Uh, Raffles Junior College to do my A-levels. And um, at that point in time, after my A-levels, I was lost. I didn't know what else to do. Totally unsure of um, you know, where I should be headed. Um, and in the typical uh, Slonis family tradition, you they would encourage the child to do a professional course, you know, a doctor, engineer, lawyer, accountant. So simply by the process of elimination, I said, all right, I will read law and I ventured to Cardiff, University of Wales, Cardiff, um, and to read law. See, my father was then um, a lecturer in uh, ITM, now UITM, Institute Technology Mara, and that um, institute had very strong ties with uh, Cardiff University. And so he wanted some <laughs> me to go to UK, but somewhere he could keep an eye on me through his friends or his lecturer colleagues. And so I headed for Cardiff, um, and there uh, they had a very sound, um, well-renowned um, uh, maritime faculty. And I had an uncle in Malaysia before I was uh, before I left for Cardiff, um, um, lawyer A. D. Raja, who said, "You know, Sitpa, maritime law, Cardiff is well known for it, and Malaysia is just opening up, uh, wanting to develop its maritime pool. If you get a chance, do it." And so I did it. And we had Professor Kurt Wallada at that time on the fac faculty. And Trish, you know how well uh, reputed he is. He was uh, instrumental in the promulgation of the UNCLOS, uh, the UN Convention on Law of the Seas in 1982, just before I, I stepped into Cardiff. So I had the great fortune of learning from Kurt Wallada, David Glass, International Trade, Maritime Law. And they just ignited a passion in me for maritime law. And I went on to Cambridge and I did my master's there in law, law of the sea and sale of goods and international trade. And it just developed from there. What do you find most appealing about the practice of maritime law? Because you've been a maritime lawyer for over 25 years. The journey began in 85, so it's almost 40 years of um, maritime law. So I'd say that a maritime law is very charming. And once you're smitten by it, it's a lifelong romance. I'm sure it's no different with you. I would completely agree with you there. <laughs> exactly. Um, you see, it, it, it's so intricate. It's got many layers of um, uh, contracts and interlinked parties. Um, and, and it poses so many challenges because the, of the metrics in which, which um, uh, issues develop. And so no two cases are the same. And every day, you know, every problem is new and challenging and exciting. And um, it's truly international. So you would get clients from all over the world, any part of the world, and their understanding of rights and obligations might be slightly different from ours. So I remember once acting for a, a ship owner whose vessel had been arrested in, in Malaysia. And I was meeting the captain who was uh, Russian, a big burly chap. And I said, you know, this is what we'll try 
to do, file papers to have the vessel released and challenge it this way. And he got the affidavits done and he signed, affirmed it and gave me a bear hug as he was leaving this huge burly chap. Um, and two days later, he bumped arrest and he left the waters despite the arrest. And I, I, was, I was, you know, dumbfounded. I had to discharge myself as solicitors because I certainly was not going to aid and abet that. But that tells you, uh, you just need to be ready for the unexpected. And it's so dynamic, uh, Trish. That's what's so brilliant about maritime law. How do you prepare for a maritime case? Can you share with us some tips and tricks? Preparing for a maritime case begins before the case comes to you. It's one of those areas where you cannot afford to learn once the brief lands on your table because the speed demanded is so quick so fast. The, the vessel needs to be arrested before she leaves port. In 24 hours, you need to know the law to get the warrant, get the ship before she sails. Um, and same with the arrest, uh, release. They can't afford for you to learn while the vessel is, you know, earning de is losing demurrage or is losing business, unable to sail. So the preparation uh, begins way before the brief hits the table. And if you've decided that you want to do maritime law, then you need to have your knowledge of the, of, on that vast spectrum that's likely to happen at your fingertips. Um, and so when it hits, we really have to drop everything else. And that's the hardest part. And I've got very understanding partners right through on all my 30 years. I had an initial friction in the early years trying to figure this out, but after that, uh, it was great. I say, I'm sorry, you're doing this. You, you're taking on this matter next because just for this next 24 hours, 48 hours, I have to step out to do an arrest because nobody else can do it. Or, you know, we, we need the, it needs my attention for this span of time. So really, you need to move, shift, think very quickly, drop everything, carry on. And of course, then it is um, liking, having the passion for that, uh, having the appetite to be excited about uh, this kind of a shift in direction, challenge, thinking out of the box, being creative, seeing the big picture and then interlacing them and saying, yes, this is the way we're going to do it. Um, so the personality to some extent matters. If you don't like being disturbed from a settled uh, you know, pattern of work or behavior, then it, it, it would be disruptive. But if you thrive on disruption and the excitement and the adrenaline, then this is perfect, really perfect. And then next moment you've done that, you sit down and you say, okay, where's that insolvency brief or where's that shareholders dispute that I was you know, working with you yesterday or day before? And you carry on, pick up where you left off. But that fluidity, that flexibility, is what I think kept me going between briefs. Because it's not every day that you have a shipping brief, and you probably know that, Trish. Uh, and so you need to have other things that you're well versed with as well. Because the other aspects of the law feed into your maritime in terms of practice, procedure, the, your relationship with the, the bench, uh, and so on and so forth. So a, a variety helps the maritime practice. Would you say maritime law has changed your personality in any way? Uh, it certainly um, made me quite resilient. Um, I think, remember, I was from the protected uh, Sri yes. Lankan family. I've come quite a long way from that. Um, it made me believe that I can do it because there were so many challenges I had to overcome uh, to get to the state uh, I am or stage I am happy with right now. And I can say that I'm happy where I am right now. Um, I wasn't always because I really wanted shipping and wasn't easy to break into shipping because, it's, as you know, Trish, it's a male-dominated uh, industry. And, you know, you go to conferences and it will be all men and you're trying to make a conversation and it's not easy. They go silent when you <laughs> walk into their table or, or just nod at you and go quiet, um, you know. So, and it's hard to get them to take uh, it was hard, not now, was hard to take me seriously. They just thought this is, you know, some little girl, uh, you know, playing with some fancy industry uh, and she's not here for the long haul. But then they found out I was in for the long haul um, and it, it became much easier after that. So it built resilience because I want it. I wanted it and that's always been my mo motto. If you want it bad enough, you will work at it hard enough. And hard enough means working on yourself, not just on the external, but on the internal the internal dialogues. You know, I can do this. I will do this. I just need to be true to myself, the cause of it, the integrity of it. And I think that personality then started developing and shone and, and, and things 
change. I, initially, it was even difficult with the bench. Um, and if, if you ask me why with the bench, because Trish, you must remember, not everyone is familiar with maritime law. And when you have to start explaining it to them, we know things that you know, are obvious, but it's not always so for the majority, not just the, law, uh, uh, the bench, but also other lawyers. When you start explaining it to them, then it's as if you're teaching them. And for judges to learn from a, a, what looks like a little small girl was not always easy. So there was a bit of a, maybe a subconscious bias. It was easier for them to listen to this big, you know, sturdy uh, uh, male lawyer compared to this trifling, uh, you know, uh, caricature that I must have seen, be seen to them um, at that point in time. But as they kept seeing me come back again and again, and I made sense, and uh, they believed that I was speaking my truth and speaking the truth. And of course, I developed a different profile. I started uh, in being involved in teaching because that's another genuine passion to teach maritime law, to develop arbitration law. And so then it became more about who I was rather than what I looked like. And then it was a home drive after that. Yeah. You mentioned arbitration and you're also an arbitrator. What made you want to be an arbitrator? And tell us a little bit about your experience being one. Sure. Actually, it was probably um, 15 years ago that I even thought about uh, becoming an arbitrator. Until then, it was council practice and very happy with the, you know, the adrenaline rush and getting into the fray. And then um, arbitration was slowly developing and I was invited to come on to the CIR, Chartered Institute of Arbitrator, the Malaysian chapter, onto their committee to represent the maritime industry. And as I got into that, I saw that as a, another fascinating opportunity um, to be able to decide on matters. So it gets a bit frustrating. At that point in time, Trish, we didn't have an admiralty court. So each admiralty case uh, was a, uh, had a learning curve for the judge, for everyone in that room. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could sit in a capacity as an arbitrator to help dis determine an issue? So I would be a quasi-judge, an arbitrator, and with my maritime um, knowledge and skill and experience, be, a much, be, be able to relate to the parties much more um, from being one of them, from being in the industry, having worked with the industry. And so that whet my appetite. Uh, and I was surprised. I, I was fairly young for that point in time. Now you get arbitrators who are very young. Uh, but at, for my time, which was about um, 14 years ago, 13 years ago, to be appointed an arbitrator um, was, I thought, doing quite well for myself. So yes, that's how I got in. And I love it. Uh, I love sitting as an arbitrator to be able to see the two sides, um, you know, and understand where they're coming from. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy that. So I would say now I have about a 50, 50 uh, division or even 60, 40 division, 60% 60 arbitrator and 40% as, as counsel. I see. You mentioned earlier some of the challenges you faced as a woman in the maritime field. So what advice would you have for aspiring women maritime lawyers or those who are already in the field? Trish, that's a beautiful question. Um, I would say that a lot of people are put off because they're challenging terminology, the future looks so uncertain, it looks like an you know, uphill task. I would say start from now. Uh, if you are excited by it, you really would like to do it, you know, you're inspired by it, just take today and each day just do what needs to be done. So for now, just need to get the skills and your knowledge up to, up to par. And once you get that, then right, and you don't have to have gone to university to learn, uh, to learn it. You can pick up a book, read about it, go to seminars, learn about it. And then I would suggest as well, if you don't get an opportunity to, to actually enter a practice that does shipping, it's all right. What you could do is be a junior to a council that, that, that does shipping. So either you have a client with a shipping problem, and I have many of those, that the, the client comes to the solicitor. The solicitor is not a shipping solicitor. They come to me or another uh, senior who does maritime, and then the transfer of information, technology, knowledge of maritime gets onto them. They get excited, and so expose yourself to as much as possible, and then just have all that I spoke about earlier, the, the, the work ethic about being flexible, being excited, energized about it, about maritime, and take it from there. Don't stop. 
I have a few questions for you now on the equanimity. Um, I would say the case of your lifetime. Definitely, Trish. <laughs> so when you were first approached to arrest the equanimity, what went through your mind? What went through my mind was, wow, uh, is this really true? Are we actually going to do this? Uh, you know, she was rumored to be in the waters. She was um, uh, the subject matter of DOJ uh, filings. You know, she was world known, world notorious. Yeah, it was a very complex case. The, the factual circumstances where uh, monies had been stolen um, from one MDB in, and, and float through 32 layers of accounts in many, many jurisdictions to get into um, Oshenko, the builder's uh, account, uh, to, for the construction and the sale of the equanimity, uh, meant that um, it was not a straightforward case highly complicated, highly complex. And while the DOJ filings gave me all the tracing of the documents and all the tracing of the uh, facts, I now had to transcribe that to fit maritime laws. And it, it's not something that had a precedent. Um, there we, we, we searched far and wide and through all the common law jurisdictions, couldn't find um, a case that fitted the circumstance. So what I had to do is work backwards to say there's a clear injustice a terrible injustice, money stolen from the people of Malaysia. The law must give redress for this, but how? And so working backwards, it took me to 1MDB. How could, and it was stolen, but that's criminal law, and that's the criminal law that DOJ used. How would it um, translate in civil law language? And so how could it leave 1MDB um, and be allowed to be stolen it must have been a breach of a fiduciary duty by the board. So that got me onto the trail of the cases uh, that developed breach of fiduciary duty and then pieced all the uh, tracing and the tools of following and tracing into the vessel. I just needed it to also be acceptable to maritime law. So what was the closest that came uh, within the wealth of precedent that we had? And it was purchase money trust in some old case. And so using that, Purchase money trust, constructive trust, breach of fiduciary duty, tracing and, and, and following, we established our case. So, it, it, and all of that took 48 hours because the, the, the sailing into Malaysian waters of the equanimity was imminent. Um, and uh, that was exhilarating. So you mentioned how complex the claim was, but what other aspects of the case would you have considered as being quite complex? The other really, really difficult part was trying to fit the framework of maritime in terms of giving good title and the procedures required for the judicial sale with the elite community that would be interested in purchasing the vessel. After all, we are arresting her to sell her to recover money and we recovered 126 million US dollars. But to ensure we adhere to the um, the, the framework of um, uh, admiralty laws meant we had to put the elite through a public tender exercise. And I've said this in some other forum that it's like asking the royalty to queue for dinner. You know, it's just so incompatible. But yet we had to go through that. We had to think about what was the best way of having that um, pan out. Um, it, we did go through that because it was a necessary step to give a clean title to the purchaser. That's our responsibility to make sure the purchaser get good, unencumbered, clean title. So when that didn't work well, in, in the sense it worked well, but it didn't give us a, a purchaser of, uh, that met, uh, the bid did not meet the appraised value, then we had to shift gear. So it was constantly thinking out of the box, what next, what next, being very, very creative. And our admiralty court, thankfully we had an admiralty court there. The judge was very um, accommodating, seeing us at short notice, um, uh, exercising her discretion within the realms of the law with flexibility. And so we then moved on to a private treaty sale. We announced what the appraised value was because then, until then it had been like a secret and a cloak and dagger sort of situation to the elite. And so when that was um, made available to the, to the um, super yacht community, uh, they knew they couldn't try their luck with really low ball offers. Um, and it filtered the curious, you know, people were just, you know, trying to get a, a bargain. And the real serious um, players came out and we managed to get, you know, um, cross the 100 million Rubicon, which is by no means easy. Um, and finally uh, managed to clinch the deal, just 4 million short of the 130 uh, million US dollars, which was the independent appraised value 
market value for the vessel. Over the nine months of handling the equanimity case, what would you say were the lessons in life and law that you learned? So Trish, um, that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> um, I found I could put it out as seven maritime lessons. And in that seven maritime lessons, I weave in my life lessons as well. Um, so the, the, the seven lessons challenged um, traditional ways we did things. Uh, we did things, as I just mentioned, uh, we had to go through a public tender exercise, but it was going to fail. It, it's almost um, predestined to fail. And so I question whether we need to go through it as well. I understand, we all understand why publicity is so important. But what we do is we couple the publicity that this vessel is going to be sailed. Anyone with a claim, come in now or forever hold your peace. So we do that publicity, very, very important for clean title. But we use that same process to invite tenders. Yeah, and that's what's unacceptable to the elite super, uh, super yacht market. So why don't we decouple it? it? Advertise, please, you have to, but you can decouple it. That advertisement does not have to invite the tenders. You can have a private negotiated, not predetermined, but privately negotiated sale um, running in parallel. So that would be an illustration of one of the lessons that we learned. And of course, the court can set, the Admiralty Court can set the ambit in our case, they said, well, privately negotiated, but nothing under 100 million is to be entertained. And the other lesson we learn is we always keep the appraised value secret. Yeah, uh, It's always in a sealed envelope, only to be opened after the bids come in. But to some markets, and it was the old-fashioned way of thinking that you don't want an opinion of a valuer to dictate what the market wants to offer. The market might want to offer far more. So why um, uh, uh, preempt a better offer? But that doesn't work in this day and age where there's so many opportunistic of, uh, offerers out there who just give you ridiculous amounts because there is no guiding price. So I'd say there's nothing to be lost in making it known like asking price is always known in any industry, especially in the super yacht industry. And then people know, all right, now this is serious money. This is a serious yacht. And I have to be with my money available before I even engage in this negotiation. So that's, those are a couple of the lessons. I have seven in, in them all together. And the life lessons, <laughs> if I may then go on to, yes, to elaborate on that, there were many. But I would say the, the biggest two would be to say, courage. I think this whole nine months, I grew up. <laughs> I grew up um, because I had to rely on myself. Um, if, you're, if you're not aligned inside of you to your truth of what is right and what is just, then it's very difficult to be courageous. But if you are aligned, then the, the sky is the limit. You go out there and make sure what you want is obtained. And that is, a, that I think is the secret recipe of success. When you're aligned with courage, integrity, success would flow. And so that was my biggest lesson. The other big lesson I learned was that we are as good as any. It's, we, you know, I don't know, but I used to have it. Maybe it's my subconscious uh, dialogue that I'm still working on, was, and I certainly worked on it then, is that you know, the other people who are better than me, maybe they can do it, or uh, another jurisdiction has more exposure, maybe they know more. But after being exposed to so many jurisdictions and professionals from all these jurisdictions, I found that we were not wanting. As long as we were aligned in our values, we had a goal, uh, we had our skill and we had our knowledge, we're on top of it, ah, you're as good as anybody else. Why was it important for you to write this book on the arrest of the super yacht? There were many reasons. Um, and I'm glad I did write that book. Um, you see, it was the, the, the nine months, the equanimity was the pinnacle of the Admiralty experience in Malaysia. It, the equanimity was historic. Yeah, not just in Malaysia, but everywhere. Every newspaper around the world, or just about, uh, carried that in the media, in the written media, in the visual media. So she was historic. And the success story of our admiralty laws were portrayed through how we handled the equanimity, that we had international uh, conventions that were implemented, adopted and implemented through this entire process. And the fact that we exercised, Malaysia exercised the rule of law was so beautifully exhibited. Um, we, we did it to such high standards that um, we could be so proud of. Why would you want to hide it under a bush? You'd write about it. And because there was no um, formal, there were orders made in court, 
their applications. I thought all those applications and orders are not captured in a single written judgment uh, of the Admiralty judge. And I thought these precedent um, would help everyone in, in, in any jurisdiction. Um, it was unprecedented and it was Malaysia's contribution to Admiralty law everywhere in the world. So I put that um, in my book um, and it's there, it's a sharing of my seven maritime lessons, a sharing of my lessons as a, a woman lawyer um, heading the team. There's so much to be shared and most of all was the exuberance that we, we had as a, a, a multi-faith, a multicultural team, legal team, working on it with a single goal of um, getting it for the country for a purpose bigger than ourselves. There's so much to tell and so much to share. It had to be recorded. How do you think the maritime law scene has evolved over the years in Malaysia? Um, in Malaysia, I think we've made huge um, uh, progress. One was what I've just mentioned about the Admiralty Court. Things are very different without the Admiralty Court. Uh, we've moved so much faster and so much more able and therefore um, invited more lawyers to become maritime lawyers. And that's the second thing. We've got that much more maritime lawyers than we did when I started. Uh, 30 years ago, it was probably about five of us who were doing Admiralty Law. And it's not much more than that. It's probably about 30, 40, but it is uh, a multiples of where we were um, 30 years ago. Um, I would say also the industry has progressed. We've made such a name for ourselves with offshore oil and gas and they're so capable of you know, maintaining international standards out there. So the work has developed on the ground. Laws have progressed. Um, and I think the big change as we saw it, Trish, you and I, from the practice point of view, was the, the shift um, from the Limitation Act of 1957 for limiting liability of ship owners and how arduous that, that process was. Um, and on to the 1976 Limitation Convention and the 96, uh, 76 Convention, 96 Protocol. Also, the amendment to the Arbitration Act made a huge difference. We were able to arrest ships for maritime arbitration anywhere in the world. And so the laws progressed as well. Um, so those would be some of the key developments, I think, uh, Trish. What would you like to see change in both the local and global maritime scene? The change in the local scene, um, I would still want to see the pool of lawyers expand. Yeah? And then we can attract. And once we have a critical mass, there's no need for the industry to rely on external resource. We still have local disputes, local arbitration, uh, having foreign um, professionals involved. And it would be nice to, have it, to arrive at a point where they feel confident enough to use just the Malaysian maritime lawyers and, and professionals. So to build our pool, there are a few laws that we still do need to change, and um, our Hague Visby uh, is almost there, but not yet uh, passed, uh, not yet gazetted, passed, but not gazetted. Um, the Bill of Lading Act would be good to have. We, we can survive without it, but it would be good to have. So those would be a few things. But I think the most critical, Trish, and I'm being totally candid and honest here, um, is to say that our maritime agencies would have to start working as one unit. Um, at the moment, they just look at their individual uh, sphere of administration, whether it's marine enforcement, whether it's immigration, you know, uh, AGC, laws, uh, customs. And, you know, we have about 22 of these different uh, agencies. It's time to come together for each one to know the entire chain and how the entire process works because we don't have self-standing problems. All our problems are interrelated and interdivisional. And so it will cut a lot of time and red tape. If you could go to one place and say, this is the problem, can't we have the, the license, the approval, this sorted out, instead of being given the runaround to go to three or four different agencies. And it would upgrade the way we present ourselves as a nation that we understand collectively, everybody in the industry knows what everybody else is doing. And I'd love to see that happen. We wanted to do that with the IMSML a few years ago. We started it and we couldn't see it through, but that's still my vision for the country. But what about the global maritime scene? Mm, that's a huge question. <laughs> uh, I would say perhaps I would like um, the social aspects of maritime law to be understood more when we deal with piracy we also address the social economic background that causes 
piracy. And when we deal with uh, technological advances, not to be swept off our feet with the technology bling and the you know, blitz, uh, but to remember the people that will be left behind if we just go too much um, into autonomous vehicles and unmanned vehicles. Um, so I'd like that. Um, I'd also like to see a bit of the reverse when it comes to South China Sea. I'd like to see uh, more reliance on what is right and what the law provides rather than all economic and social to that extent. That would be my few comments on the global scene, Trish. Sipa, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our interview. I would really like to ask you so many more questions, but we've run out of time. Um, again, thank you very much for sitting down with us, for taking the time to share you know, your thoughts, your words of wisdom, and I hope this will be an inspiration to others. Thank you, Trish, for sharing your time with me. I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I hope others will too. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Sipa.